1971, the United States had paper bills that were like checks in a checkbook. They didn't have any value. But what they would do is they'd get you gold. Because the U.S. wrote more checks than it had gold in the bank, the gold was going down. And on August 15th, 1971, I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And I watched Nixon said, they're not going to get you gold. So it defaulted. And I went on the floor of the stock exchange and I said, wow, this is a crisis. And I thought it would go down on the stock market and it went up a lot. And so I researched it and I found that on March 5th, 1933, the exact same thing happened. Roosevelt announced that they were not going to get the gold and that they would go off that and that they would print a lot of money and they printed a lot of money. And what I realized at that time, and saw many times since, that anything that surprised me may not have happened in my lifetime, but happened before. I studied the Great Depression. Because I did that, I was able to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis. We made a lot of money in the financial crisis because I understood what happened in the Great Depression. So in this case, three big things are happening that never happened before in our lifetimes. And the last time they happened was in the 1930 to 45 period. And those three things are the creation of a lot of printing of money to pay for the debts. We needed to at the time, but it was very overdone. We actually sent out checks, which were about five times as much as the amount that would have compensated people for their losses. Where'd they get the money from? The government borrowed the money. Who did they borrow the money from? the Federal Reserve. So now everybody gets all these checks and everybody's happy because they get all these checks. But when they get all this money and then they spend it, everybody's surprised they got inflation. We've increased the amount of money by 25% or more. The price of anything is equal to the amount of money and credit spent on it divided by the quantity of it sold. And so when you increase the amount of money and credit, buying power, spending, by a lot more than you increase the quantity, you get inflation. Because what happened in both of those cases is they hit zero interest rates. So I can't lower the price of money, so what do I do? Number two is the amount of internal conflict that's going on in the United States, the size of the wealth gaps, the size of the political conflicts is the greatest since not only the 30 to 45 period, it's much greater than that, 1900. You have to go back to 1900 to have that conflict. We're having a form of a civil war where populism is one side in a battle with the other side that won't accept losing. Well, that's why in the next elections, there's a good chance that neither side will accept the result and accept losing. History shows that when the causes people are behind, are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. Right now, there's not much agreement and the polarity is becoming greater. The political right now, if you follow politics, if you even watch events like, you know, what will the reaction be to Supreme Court making the decision of Roe versus Wade? Why are moderates in the political system choosing not to run for re-election? We have this internal conflict that is actually threatening rule of law and the adherence to the Constitution. It's entirely possible that people with different views, they will go to different places and they will fight. So that degree has never happened in my lifetime before. 1945 was when the new world order began. These world orders happen because there's a conflict and then somebody wins. So that brings me to the third thing that's happening which is the rise of a great power to be comparable, China, and with it, Russia, and they form alliances, right? There's the allied powers and the Axis powers, two different sides, kind of, and then they're competing because what happens is when you have a new world order, the winners of the war get to set the rules. So in 1945, America won, and it was the richest country in the world. It had 80% of the world's gold, and gold was money. And it had 50% of the world's economy. And it had a monopoly on military power. It set the rules, and that's why the UN is in New York, and the World Bank and the IMF are in Washington, D.C. It set the rules. So that's changing. There are certain things that we're doing. We're spending a lot more than we're earning. We're living off the printing presses. 
We're letting the infrastructure go. We're giving our next generation debts. We're not educating all children well. If you educate your people and they are more civil with each other and you provide equal opportunity, the system will work better. In this world order battle, and we have a world order battle, there is an allied and axis power kind of thing that is emerging. There's certainly a competition. There are five different kinds of wars. There's a trade war. There's a technology war. There is a geopolitical influence war. There is a capital war. And there could be a military war. There is a military war now in Europe with Russia. And those are the patterns of history. And there's only one way to do well, and that is to be strong in all those ways. So I'm very bipartisan. I believe the opposite of the polarity, the extremes of the left or the right. I pray for the middle and bipartisanship to find ways. I've watched the process evolve in the cycle. So what happens is you have the war, you have the new rules, wars are sort of great equalizers, and then you come back. And then you have a period of peace and prosperity. You have peace because nobody wants to fight the dominant power, and you have more equal people, and then they have prosperity. But the way the system works is over a period of time, that creates differences in wealth. And that's fine. You provide capital, that's the capital system. People with great ideas come along and they're productive and inventive and they produce great things and so on. But as they obtain the greater wealth, they also obtain greater benefits like they could educate their children better. And if you're poor, you don't get to educate your children better. And so the polarity increases and it becomes unfair because, you know, we all should have like equal opportunities. And then you also build up a lot of debt. Here's the irony of it. As these cycles begin at their later stages, the rich are the ones who get into debt. Now you would think it's exactly the opposite, right? Because if yeah. you're rich, it's easier to have a good living standard and save. But like the United States, when per capita income was 40 times that in China, it started to borrow from China because they have a big saving mentality. When you have a poor person who doesn't have much, they want to save. Their saving is in our currency because when they think, oh, how do I save in world currency? I'm going to buy dollar denominated debt and I'm going to save in it when we borrow. And that's been the case. We didn't experience what our prior generations experienced. I know my dad went through World War II. He went through depression and war. His mentality is very different in terms of, you know, what you take for granted or how you save. And that creates a...